Moses, I was glad what they said unto me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't think we understand what kind of a privilege it is for us to come into the house of the Lord. I understand. I get it. You've been going through. I understand you have some things that are on your mind. You have some pressures and some issues that you're dealing with. But just to know that we made it. We got here. We got into the house. Is enough to give God praise.
left my briefcase at home. And it's not like I'm around the corner, I can just hop in the car and hop over there and get it real quick. But thanks be to God that I have a, a system. I, I do things systematically, so I can pull it up from my phone. Uh, so I don't think that I'm preaching from my phone because I want to be cool or fattish. Uh, because especially knowing where I am approaching the, the, the birthday that I'm approaching in two weeks, I am beyond the place of small print. Now, now I don't have reading glasses yet, but I am far beyond small print. Uh, but I thank God that he is able and that he makes a way for us, certainly if we allow him to, amen. And what I realize is that we have a choice, though. We have a choice when things don't go our way or they don't go as planned. We can sit and wallow in the situation or we can learn how to persevere, overcome. And what I realize is some people say that they are okay say that they're over it, but there's a lot of people who are stuck in yeah, yeah, that yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pastor Kenny said something a few moments ago about uh, remembering something and how the heart can remember as well. Certain things will remind you of things. Mm -hmm. And that's when you really learn what you have overcome and what you have not overcome. Yes, yes. Based on when the memory rises, mm -hmm. what it does to you internally, what wow. it does to you emotionally. Yes. So many of us tend to just put things away. Put them in the cupboard, put them under a, a, a bowl to hide it. We put it out of sight, and out of sight we think is out of mind. But even if it's out of sight and out of mind, it doesn't mean that it's out of your spirit. There's still some things you have to deal with, some things you have to let go. And I will shamelessly take this moment to plug my wife's latest book that she published, uh, you know, about breaking free, free of soul ties. We want to get you. Uh, a, a copy of that, but uh, it, it was the process of her writing the book that she realized she still had some things she had to deal with. All right, all right. So when you read I Am Not My Soul Ties, you start thinking about just how much stuff in your past you have carried to your present and how much it has kept you from being all that you can be. The reason why we do this is, is not, it's not a mystery. It is a, a clear case of the human condition. See, we are programmed to be concerned about self-preservation. Mm -hmm. We always want to look our best, yes. be our best. We don't want to consider any part of us is not right. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like a vulnerability that we're not emotionally capable of accepting the idea that there's something in me that's just not right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's the same way it is that we, we, whenever we approach, we don't, we don't really tend to take risks in life. We don't tend to put ourselves out there for anything that we don't think is going to be a sure bet. Mm -hmm. In my house, you will see that in two rooms of our house, there is a lot of space where the, the shelves are filled with games. We have a lot of games, and for many reasons. One, because we had nonprofit that we were dealing with children, and my wife, you know, used the games for them. But then, true, more true to the fact is that my wife just loves games. She loves games, and any excuse she can find to buy a new game, she's gonna buy a new games. So we got all kinds of board games and card games, and just a whole bunch of games. Uh, and, and she really enjoys taking time out to sit down with the kids and play the games. And I realize there are certain games that I like more than others. Yeah. And it's not because I'm not good at the other games, mm -hmm. but because for me, the idea of playing games is all about the process and all about the fun of the game, mm -hmm. not necessarily who wins or who loses. Yeah. I know some of you are looking at me right now like I'm crazy, you know, because you, cause there's a lot of people in the room who, if they're honest with themselves, are uber competitive. <laughs> they don't want to do it if they can't win. It's okay, I know who you are. You know who you are. It's all right. You can be that way. I'm not telling you there's anything wrong with who you are. But this is expressly why I refuse to learn how to play spades. Uh, I don't know how, and I will not learn how, because I've seen too many spade games get ornery and yes. full-on aggressive. Yes. I will not participate in that kind of foolery because I just want to have fun. See, some of y'all don't know how to have fun. I was talking with uh, a friend of mine and his wife last week at his birthday party and they were talking about 
of their youngest child. The kids were out playing in the yard and they were having, you know, a good time. But of course, there was uh, some obvious competitiveness going on, mm -hmm. and you could tell that the littlest one didn't like to lose. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about it, laughing about it. And, and my friend's wife, she said, "Yeah." She said, "We were driving past Top Golf, and we pointed it out to him. We were telling him about it." And she said, "His first response was his first question was, how do you win?'" <laughs> He's not really concerned or interested in the experience. He knows that it's, it's a game. It's, it's competitive. And there are winners and there are losers. And all he really wants to know is, how do you win? And I, I thought about that. I really wish that more of us in the body of Christ have a winning mindset. And I understand that it's much harder to get that winning mindset in this day and age because we live in a time, and I'm sorry if this insults your uh, sensibilities, but we live in a time where everybody gets a war just for participating. Yeah, yeah. And then at a time where everybody gets a trophy just for showing up. Uh, I was listening to a comedian the other day who was talking about how he went to a soccer game and he was asking who was winning and they said, oh, we don't keep score anymore. Uh, what is the point then uh, if you're doing that particular activity if you don't have the expectation of either winning or losing? And even in our losing, and here's what the, 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 the coaches and sports used to teach kids who participated, is that back then, even in your losing, you were winning because you were learning how to deal with disappointment That's right. That's right. That's right. and when things don't go your way. That's right. Don't get me wrong, I love spoiling my children. I love giving them a lot of things. I love especially providing for them things that I feel that I didn't have when I was a child. But at some point, I realized that they have to hear no and be okay with no because the world is not going to keep telling them yes. The world doesn't care how much they bat their eyes and how nicely they may ask or how, uh, you know, how they try to, my grandmother would say, hand them up. Grandma Dolly used to say, you try to hand me up what you want. What you, you know, you know, ask real nice, Grandma, what you want, try to hand me up. The world doesn't care about that because the world, just like us, is worrying about how it can preserve itself. Every man or woman for itself is like in the world. So we realize that with that mentality, with that mindset, people are doing everything they can to try to come out on top, even if it means Rewriting the rules. Well, I wish I had some help right through here. If we realize that the game cannot be won with our capabilities and abilities, we turn around and try to rewrite the rules. You don't believe me? Look at Congress and look at Senate. When it doesn't work for this party or that party, if we get enough of a majority, we can get together and we can rewrite the rules. Because at the end of the day, all that matters is that we, we win. You are naturally competitive or whether you are someone who is just looking to make sure that they are not embarrassed you will find yourself somewhere in this paradigm somewhere in this shift of extremes when it comes to everything in life especially your faith and what the question is is how do we learn especially as believers because we as believers are the worst ones when it comes to thinking that everything should go right how do we deal with when things go wrong even more than that how do we deal with things going wrong and coming into the reality that they went wrong because of us that I am at fault for how things have ended up the way they've ended up right now I know it's a tough pill to swallow but it's just a little dose of reality. What happens when it's not a game anymore, when it's your life? Mm. That's right. Too many people are approaching life as if it's a game. They are approaching it as if they can always go back and hit reset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, when I was a kid, uh, we had a lot of video games and you know, Nintendo and all that, and sometimes you played with the real competitive ones who had real bad attitude and probably didn't have good home training. They didn't like how the game was going. These little bad behind children would get up and push reset or push the play, the power button to stop the game. Oh, oh it, it, it didn't begin with video games. You know, people uh, didn't, you know, if you're playing checkers and you weren't winning, they'd swipe the board. Yeah. Just, you know, people have, have found ways to just act out because they believe that it's okay. We get another shot. We get another bite at the apple. But the reality is that in the game of life, and I'm not talking about the board game, in the game of life, we get one chance. We get one shot. 
And so many of us are betting on tomorrow that we're ignoring the realities of today and not dealing with the things that are within our reach to deal with. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. The real question, though, is what happens next? What happens once you win or once you lose? The true measure of a person's character and the depth of their faith is what they do after they have lost. Take Job, for example, who was righteous by all accounts. And all that he dealt with, all that he struggled with, was because of the fact that he was righteous. Not because he was lawless and unrighteous, but because he loved God, he had to suffer. And the question I ask you is, could you be like Job? Because remember, Job didn't get angry and shake his fist at God. Job didn't start cussing and carrying on. Job turned around to those who were in his inner circle, to his wife, the one whom he was most intimate with, and he asked her this question, must we accept only good from God uh -huh, uh -huh. and not trouble? Exactly. See, Job understood something that was only revealed to him in the spirit realm. The fact that in all things, we are victorious yeah. through God. God. Yeah. If I have to go through, it's all right because I'm going through. Yeah. I'm not staying in the middle of it. Yeah. What we realize is that from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, we find people whose names we know to this day, not because they were so awesome and never failed and never had trouble, but because they were overcomers. Yeah. Because they dealt with adversity and struggle, yes. difficulty and failure, and kept going Amen. until they won. Amen. Amen. Our text today in these scriptures, we find the relations of John the Apostle that were written sometime between uh, 35 to 50 years after the ascension of Jesus, after he goes back to the Father to prepare a place for us. John receives from Jesus via an angel these divine revelations that he shares with us and that he shares specifically with these seven churches in Asia. And it's interesting to me that when you look at the uh, way that these letters are written, uh, we find that to the, each of these seven churches there is a theme. There is typically a praise or criticism and exhortation and reward. Each church, as he addresses them, they fall into one of these four categories. However, two of the seven churches receive no criticism, and two of the seven churches receive no praise. Sardis, unfortunately, is one of those churches that receive no praise, only criticism. Sardis was once the capital of the Lydian Empire. It was built on a peak, on a mountain. And it had three sides of this city that were uh, like peaks. Uh, and they were only accessible. They, they led down to 1,500 feet down to the valley floor, which means that it was going to be a hard climb to get from the valley floor up to the city if you tried to come through one of those three sides, especially because the sides of the mountains were smooth. And so the people of Sardis believed themselves to be safe from intruders or occupying forces because of the construction of the city. They felt like this rock is enough to protect us. Yeah. So they focused all their attentions militarily on the one entrance where they expected the enemy to come. Uh, but history tells us that their security they found in their geography was misplaced. Two occasions, on two occasions, Sardis ends up being overcome and captured. So they put all their resources and attention into that one entrance point that they didn't even fathom the idea that their enemy could be so concerned with winning that they would do whatever it took to catch them off guard. I want to pause here for a moment and give you a word of inspiration from the Holy Spirit. You must realize that in this life, we are dealing with an enemy who will stop at nothing to steal, kill, and destroy. He does not play by any rules. In fact, he makes the rules up as he goes along. All he needs is a vulnerability in us to put a foothold, and he will catch us off guard. I like to 
think of him a lot like the vampire movies, you see? Because the truth of the matter is that he cannot get to us unless we allow him to. Amen. He looks for our vulnerabilities. He does not overcome us and he does not overpower us. In fact, the Bible says all we really have to do is to resist him. And he will flee. And so we got to ask yourself, a lot of us are dealing with some things and we're putting it on the devil and we never talk about in the ways in which we have tried to resist it. Besides, Bessarius was being captured by the Persians and the Romans, and they never regained independence after their captivity. In about AD 17, the city was destroyed by an earthquake and was rebuilt by the help of Emperor Tiberius. So now, because they had put so much into their structure, so much into who they thought they were as an identity, we are a city built on a hill. We're powerful and strong. Nobody can overtake us. Now their pride and their hubris has knocked them down a few pegs because not only have they been captured twice, now their city has been destroyed by natural disaster. Now a once thriving and bustling city needs help. They come and they reach out to help, but all help comes at a cost. They get Emperor Tiberius to help them, but because now he has helped them, he essentially owns things. So yet they're still in captivity financially. By the time of John's revelation, the city was still bustling and prosperous, but nothing like it had been once before or ever would be again. The church at Sardis seemed to have adapted the culture of the city because the church, too, thought that it was doing well. The church, too, thought that because it was still alive, still existing there, that it was prospering. But here's the reality of things. Just because the doors of the church are open, just because people are coming and sitting in, doesn't mean that things are going as planned. God himself speaks it to his son, who speaks it to the angel, who speaks it to John and comes and tells him, listen, you think you're alive, but you're dead. you sing the same songs and you mm. give the same offering and you serve in the same ministry with consistency that it means that God is pleased. The Bible says, God said you have unfinished work. You think just because on the outside the appearance of your work is enough that God is pleased, but God says the work is not done. It reminded me as I read this of why we named our church website livingfinish.com. I was given a preaching assignment over eight or ten years ago and I was preaching about the work, the ministry and the Lord said we have to live finished which means every day when we get back to our homes and lay our heads down on our beds we know that we've done all that we could have done that day to honor God and fulfill the mandate on our lives. So that if we don't wake up that next morning, the work is done. But we have this mentality. We have this mentality where we keep putting things off to tomorrow. What is required of us to do today. I did not say what we can do today. What is required of us to do today. Do you understand, people of God, that the Bible here, especially in Revelation, is all about urgency. They are speaking an urgent message to the church and to the people of God to get it right now before time runs out. And yet we still say, tomorrow. Specifically, God says, I know your deeds. He says, I know your deeds. You're unfinished. You think that because you run faster than the other ones, you think that because you're lighter on your feet than the other fighter. You think you're all that. But the battle is not over and the race is not finished. And the Bible says that the battle is not given to the strong nor the race to the swift, but to the one who endures. So tomorrow is a new day. When we get up tomorrow, it's a new fight. It's a new race. 
It's a new work to be done. And just the way we want to sing that His grace and His mercy, they're new every morning, new every morning, great is our faithfulness. Every morning when we wake up, God's looking at us going, new is your assignment, new is your responsibility, new are the souls that are waiting for you to live out loud. He says, he says, it's not about what you've done, but what you're going to do and what you're doing right now. Jesus said, it doesn't matter what you used to do. You're dead. Not only that does he say you're dead. He says, you're dead and dying. Get that, get that. He says, I see that there's still people there. You're living in this city that was once a great city. And it's funny because I listen to people talk about certain cities and talk about how they were in their heyday and how they were back in the day and how this neighborhood was nice and that neighborhood was nice. And there are people who are stuck living in that time where thinking about how it used to be that they can't wrap their minds around how it is now. And the problem with that is that if you don't realize what you're looking at now, you can't figure out how to fix it and make it better. Not making it what it used to be because what it used to be is no more. What God wants from us is what we should be, who we could be. When he looks at us, he sees potential. He sees possibility. When we look at ourselves, we see problems. He says it's dying. But if you wake up and strengthen what remains, you can save yourself from the path you're heading down. As a grim as this message may seem, it is actually one of hope because God yes. understands that he wants the most for his people, the best for his people. And so he spends his time speaking to his angel, speaking to his messenger through his angel to give us a word of instruction and direction yes. so that we can gain Reward. And isn't that really what all of us really want in the end anyway? We want to win because we know there's a reward yeah. at the end of the game. Sometimes the reward is only bragging, right? Sometimes yeah. only people yeah. say, I beat you. I did the best. You always win, but today I won. Here it is in the game of life. The reward is more life. Yeah. I wish I had a church that would help me right through here. The Bible says that we live this life to live it again. Yeah. Even when this flesh passes away, there is still a whole lot more for this spirit to do. But here's the thing. We don't know who won or who lost until it's all over. Until the day when he comes back and he calls us to account for what we've done. And then when that happens, we must give an account for what we've done. Then we learn who really has won or who has lost. He says, but there's still time. Remember, Jesus' ultimate message is you can do better. Yeah. This message is not just about the church at Sardis. It's about the believers. Yeah. Wherever they find themselves, yeah. we are called consistently as people of God to ask ourselves, how can I do better? Yeah. I realize that people are consistent in prayer. There's a lot of folk who are on the prayer line constantly, aren't you? But my question is, how much listening do you do versus how much speaking? We understand that prayer has to be a dialogue. It has to be a conversation with God. And some of us are stuck and don't know how to move forward because we keep talking and we're not listening. We keep moving our pieces around on the board, but we have not looked at what the complications could be for each move that we make. I, I, I am not a, a good chess player, but I'm interested in the game and I'm working on it. And I realize that I have to be patient and not impulsive when it comes to chess. This is one of the struggles that we have, is that we think of our former glory over time, or we think of what we could be, and what we were thinking about is winning, that we don't think strategy. And so here we are, a lot of us are caught in a time warp uh, that year, that decade when we gave our life to Christ. Mm -hmm. But if we look back over the time, we have to ask ourselves, what have I done with my faith from when I said yes to today? Have I done better today than I did yesterday? Am I confident that God would be pleased with what I've done? Jesus and his Jesus's indictment against Sardis was that they were caught in a time warp. 
They thought they were doing something because they were doing what they had always done. But listen, people of God, if we always do what we've always done, then we'll always get what we've always got. I heard it said before, I think it's so poignant, that the, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. God said, here you are, and you want to know why you have a heart for souls, but you can't get people to give you the time of day. Have you changed your methods? You want to know, God, I want to sing for you, but I still can't find that note. Well, have you changed your methods? God, I want to preach your word, but I just can't seem to find the, 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 the way to do it right. God said, have you checked your methods? Here's what I understand. We will invest our time and attention in everything but God. There are some people who will spend time on YouTube and Pinterest and all these other places on the website to try to understand how to crochet better, how to bake better, how to fix their cars, do all these things. But we won't spend 15 minutes in the Word of God to learn how to be a better person. you said, yes, God, I trust you. Yes, God, I believe you that the work is done. No, it's only begun. Yeah. Strengthen what remains. What does it mean that they have to strengthen what remains? It means that they have lost. It means that they have lost. They've lost people. They've lost influence. They've lost power. They've lost their prominence in the city. They've lost the ability to be a beacon. Understand what's happening right now in the text, in this time and culture. John is speaking to these seven churches because the church worldwide is undergoing persecution. And God is trying to inform his church, to strengthen his church on how to survive and come out on the other side. Yeah. And I want you to understand, people of God, that being his people, being saved, does not mean that we don't have struggle, that we don't have conflict. Faith is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of power yeah. to deal with trouble. Yeah. God said, here you are. I want you to understand that there's going to come a troubling time ahead, that as the persecution continues to grow, and as people continue to become more and more uh, Begin to hate the church more and more. You've got to be prepared for how to minister and be effective even in the darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's the thing. Difficulty and darkness should not trouble the believer. Why? Because the Bible says we are the lights. Mm -hmm. Let your light so shine. The light does its best work in darkness. And yet we don't want to talk to people who don't know, who haven't been churched. We don't want to talk to people who don't know what the glory of poetry is, who don't know how to say the Lord's Prayer, who don't know how many books are in the Bible. We don't want to spend time with people in the mud and the muck and the mire. We don't want to give people our attention and embrace them if they don't look like they're church ready. He says, you failed. You have failed the test. You have failed the game. You have failed every way imaginable, but all is not lost. Strengthen what remains. Unfortunately, people have become more concerned with not failing than actually winning. And so what do we do? We become, uh, we, we've learned to become complacent. Complacent. And a lot of people, I don't think, understand the true definition of the word. The word from its root actually means to be pleased with the mediocre. We've, we've learned to be okay with just good enough. We've learned to compromise. Complacency and compromise have been taken the place of actually winning. Like I said before, all we need to do is show up when we get the trophy. All we need to do is be a member of the team when we feel like we get the trophy. But God said there is no salvation by association. If you're going to be saved, you've got to walk this walk for yourself. The Bible says, work out your own soul's salvation. Even while you're trying to help other people learn who he is. Disciples that 
make disciples. And I believe that God was displeased with the church at Sardis because they had become comfortable with just doing church as usual. They had become comfortable with just doing what they had always done. There was no expectation that God would speak something new to their spirit. There was no expe expectation that the Holy Spirit would come in and shake things up and move the service around. They were going through the motion. Would you go to a hospital and put your trust in a surgeon who goes through the motions but really has no experience or expertise in how to do the job? Yet here we are and we expect God to have faith in us and yet we spend no time in the word. We spend no time praying. We spend no time fellowshipping with each other. And I'm not just talking about showing up at church. I'm talking about fellowshipping with yeah. each other. See, some folks be smiling. Cross the eye. Hey, how you doing? God bless you. Grace and peace. God bless you. All those beatitudes, all those beautiful phrases. Couldn't even get in the car right before you start talking. Mess. Oh, here's my favorite one. Oh, really? I'm going to pray for you. Okay, do it now. Do it now. Take my hands and pray for me right now. Is not fooled. We can fool each other, but God is not fooled. And we keep wondering why we're not seeing any change, why we're not seeing more power, because God said, I've seen what you're doing with what you have. You're wasteful. Strengthen what remains. Here's, here's how we do it, and I'm going to get out your way. Watch, here's what we have to do. For many, the compromise is the offspring of complacency because we become so pleased with just being able to be in the game. We become pleased with just being able to be counted in the number. It is enough for us. We don't have to win. We just got to get recognized. We got to have our name up on the board, get our name in the roster of people who are playing. If, if the church recognizes me for being a member for over 10 years, I've done it. If, if I get a chance to be the president of the choir, I, I've done it. If they give me a chance to preach uh, at least once a year, I'm doing all right. Uh -uh. Complacency gives birth to compromise. And after a while we realize, well, nobody's really checking me anyway. Nobody really knows where I go and what I do. Nobody really talks to me about what's going on in my personal life anyway. Nobody really cares about how I'm living anyway. I guess I can just keep preaching and be sitting over here and keep keep prophesying and be all jacked up in finances. I guess I can keep skimming a little bit off the top and nobody's paying attention. Complacency leads to compromise and compromise leads to failure. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And here's the thing. They were dead and didn't know it. And there are people who have excused their own personal behavior for so much they don't realize that they're sinners. See, we're all sinners. Yes. But it's a troubling thing when you don't realize and can't accept the fact that you're a sinner who's trying not to sin. Mm. When you become comfortable in your sin and you have explained it away, you, you made excuses for it, yeah. you failed. Mm -hmm. So much so that we have begun to substitute, lose it with compromise, and here we are in this predicament where we don't realize that so much of us that is valuable has died off. In true Jesus fashion, he offers the church a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. He says, go from here and finish strong. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's, that's the problem. That's why a lot of people can never overcome in their disputes and their compromises with each other because they keep on rehashing stuff. Yeah. It, it's, it's a natural thing, isn't it? Yeah. You think the argument is over and you go in the other room and you're still arguing and you come back. But another thing, uh -huh. see, because what I really want to say we don't know how to really let things go. We don't know how to process things. And this is why when I'm upset with people, I, I get quiet. I have, to, I have to step back because I only want to say what I have to say one time. And I want it to be right. And I don't want to be out of anger. I don't want it to be an outburst. I want it to be powerful enough to solidify and solve our issue so we can move on. That's a, that's a lot of people's problem. See, we, we, the Bible says be angry. Sin not. We got a lot of folks who are angry and it leads them to sin. We got a lot of folks, the Bible says, be slow to speak, quick to listen, quick to reconcile. A lot of people are quick to speak, slow to reconcile. I wish I had some help, right? 
You have to understand that the Bible has already laid it out for us. The keys to winning the game. The rules are already laid out for us. All we've got to do is become consistent in following the rules. But Jesus loves us so much. He says, even though you've jacked this thing up, I have a way of escape for you. I've got a plan for you. Just follow my plan and I'll get you out of this. Stop worrying about what you've already done. Uh-huh. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. He said, if you're faithful enough to ask for forgiveness, he's faithful enough to give it. He's throwing it into the sea of forgetfulness. Let that go and move from here. Yes, sir. What do you say in verse 3? He says, remember what you received, what you heard, and hold on to it and repent. Most important word, repent. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. This is where most of us get tripped up and fail consistently. Mm -hmm. We understand we've gone wrong, mm -hmm. and we want to do better, but we never make the turn. Mm -hmm. Repent means to turn away from to. Yeah. So if I'm going in this direction, which I know does not honor God, I can't begin to honor him until I turn away from that direction and start going where he's called me to. Yeah. Yeah. And here's what, here's what we do. We turn halfway, <laughs> stuck between here and there. Keep talking about what, you know, trying to explain it. But God, you know, I, I was only going that way because, and, 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 and things only worked out that way because. This is true, isn't it? You know who the first one to do that was? Adam. He's caught. What's the first thing he says? Well, God, the, the woman you put here with me already shifted in blame. Sorry, fellas, I got to tell the truth. It's, already, it's in the Bible. I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Here we are in this, this horrible predicament, but they have an opportunity now. We can stay going the direction that we're going in, knowing that it leads to sure death. We can stay in between, trying to excuse and make explanations for why we were going that way in the first place. Or we can forget that direction and turn towards God. He says, remember what you were given, what you heard. What were we given? We were given the gospel. We were given salvation. We were given a chance. He said, you heard it. Hold on to it. Now repent. Yeah. Go back away from the way that you were going towards where you were called to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank How many of you would be bold enough to be in the store and your mama call your name and keep walking away from her? Ooh. And yet God consistently calls our name and we turn our back to him. Am I helping anybody? Listen. He said, listen. You've got to take what you've been given and turn away and start going in the right direction. The first step, now I'm closing up, watch. The first step to strengthen what remains is we have to determine what went wrong. Once we realize that we have gone wrong with God, we've got to, we've got to identify that, be honest with ourselves. I ain't worried about everybody else. You ain't got to tell everybody else where you went wrong. Be honest with yourself because here's the problem. Plenty of us will do it. We'll tell everybody where we went wrong. But we've never sold it in ourselves. Why? Because people like attention. Oh, I'm going to tell the truth today and shame the devil. I hope you all don't mind. I'm going to tell the truth. We like attention. We like people being sorry for us. But what does it matter if you're sorry for me and God is still not pleased? Your sympathy, your empathy for me cannot get me into heaven. Determine what was wrong and turn away from it. The second step, listen, what we got to do next. He says you have to assess what's left. I can't strengthen what's left if I don't know what I have left. Here's the other problem. We get so downtrodden once we come to ourselves. I love that phrase, come to ourselves. The Bible says the prodigal son was out there, face down in the mud, wanted to fill his stomach with the pods, the pits were eating, and finally he came to himself and realized what a predicament he was in. When we come to ourselves and understand just where we are, something has to happen. We gotta realize, we gotta realize what we have at our resources, what we have at our disposal. Yes. In order to strengthen what's there, I gotta stop beating myself up over what I lost. Yeah. Uh, let that man go, let that woman go, let that job go, let that house go, let all that stuff go. If it was taken out of your life, it was taken for a reason because all things, I don't know about you, but I believe the Bible says all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. All things good and bad. Let y'all wake now, let y'all wake now. Watch, he says, Look at what you have left. You gotta be honest with yourself about where you have found yourself. Be honest with yourself about how you got there. Why did I lose what I lost? How 
why did I let myself get into this place? Because if I don't realize how it happened the first time, it's bound to happen again. And I cannot strengthen what I have left if I don't realize that it's all I have left. He said, look around, see what you didn't lose. See what you still have. The first and most important asset that we have that we must strengthen is our life. Every morning you wake up, open your eyes, and draw breath into your lungs, you must realize that you're already starting on the right track. Can I get two people to say amen? You, know, must, all, you must realize that because God has allowed you to draw breath on this day, this is the best day of your life. This is a day filled with possibilities and probabilities. Everything will be all right. I know, I know the waterfalls that ain't working right, we got some plumbing issues, and the lights ain't working right, but everything will be all right. I got one more chance. I got one more chance, God, to get it right. I got one more chance to get on the track that you want me to be on. Everything will be all right. It's strengthen what remains. Resist the temptation to appraise or evaluate what you have. Don't start looking at what you have and saying, oh, well, I know this is what I have left. I didn't lose everything, but is this going to be enough? Yeah. Jesus said, we got to feed the people. Mm -hmm. The apostles and disciples said, well, we got these two fish. Mm -hmm. We got these five loaves. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say that's not enough. Nobody said that's not enough. Everybody just started eating. Yeah, yeah. I want you to understand that you have to engage. You gotta get get in the fight with what you have. Yeah. How many of you right now? I hate to use this this this, uh, this example, but how many of you right now, if a fight broke out, will be saying to yourself, well, "I don't have anything to defend myself." Find what you can and survive. I want you to know right now, if you got seven dollars in your bank account, take your seven dollars, put it in God's hands, and survive. I know you may not have the best singing voice, but if you just open your mouth and say, "Glory." Strengthen what remains. Take what I got. I ain't worried about what I don't have. I know what I do have. And I serve a God who can take two fish and five loaves and feed the multitudes. Every day is a new opportunity. It's a new opportunity. Verse 2, he says, wake up. You've got to wake up. You've got to change your mindset. So in order for me to strengthen what remains, I've got to know what went wrong. I've got to take an assessment of what I have left. And I've got to wake up and stop thinking about things from a fleshly perspective. It is our flesh that causes us to believe that there are limitations in our life. But the spirit says there are no limitations. There are no boundaries. I tell Kingdom Life Cathedral all the time, we don't have to think outside the box. we got to think as though there is no box. Who told you there's a boundary or a barrier? I said, who told you you were naked? Stop to answer that question. It was the enemy who told them they were naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The enemy is telling you you don't have the education, you don't have the resources. The enemy is telling you your faith is not good enough. The enemy is telling you you don't have the power and the strength to take down this adversary. Yeah, wake up, God says. He says, Wake up. Stop dreaming. Stop believing what the enemy keeps telling you. And listen to what I've told you. Remember it. He said, hold on to it. He said, repent. This is also honest. This is time of being honest. It's an honest assessment. He says, if you don't wake up, if you don't wake up, I am coming back. You've got to know I am coming back. And I'm going to take an account when I come, when I come back. I want you to understand, people of God, he is coming back. He's coming back and he says, you won't know when. You won't know how. But I will get back. And when I get back, I hope to find faith in the earth. I hope to find my people serving me without reservation, without hesitation. I hope to find a people who will move by my word and not by their emotions. Third thing, third and final thing we got to do if we're going to strengthen what remains, we have to do something. Here's the problem. We don't like to work for anything. We don't like to work for anything. We don't, we don't want, we don't like to. We think about what Jesus did for us. We think about the sacrifice. We think about the cross. And yet still we cannot be bothered to give him even a quarter of our day. Can't be bothered to give him a couple minutes of our time. And then expect him to do more than what he's already done on the cross. The only way for us to strengthen what remains 
is that we put in the work yes. necessary to fortify what we have. The very idea of strengthening what remains is the reality of working. Working doesn't bother us, if we're being honest. It doesn't bother us when it's something we want. That's right. Mm, that's right. Uh, they told you somebody was giving away something, but you got to fill out these 15 forms. Yeah. Or you'll find some time. Oh, yeah. You won't miss your bus. I get the next one. Uh, I get the next one. I've been needing one of these. Yeah. Oh, no. And, and, is it, and is it my color, too? Oh, we'll find all kinds of excuses. You don't know. And, and, and then, then we put it on God. Oh, I know this is God. He's blessing me right now. Uh -huh. I tell you, my rent was going to be late. I spent $300 on lottery tickets. Do you know the Lord gave me $400? Oh, isn't it any good? My goodness. He says, you got to put in the same amount of effort and work that you put into failing relationships. Toxic work environments. Hollow hobbies. Put that same energy into worship. Put that same energy into being who he's created you to be. Put that same energy into correcting and strengthening what you got left. Do it like your life depends on it. Because yeah. yeah. it does. Yes, it does. Thank you, sir. Yes, In order to strengthen what we have left and use it for the glory of God, we must work differently, deliberately, and divinely. What does that mean, differently? You can't keep doing what you used to do. Can't keep going. You gotta move some some things around in your life. Put different people in different positions in your life. You keep depending on that one person. Switch it up. Make a partnership and alliance with somebody else. Here you are trying to fly like an eagle, but you keep running with turkeys. They can't fly. They can't teach you anything. They can't get you where you want to go. You want to become financially savvy and sound, but you're hanging out with broke people. Ain't nothing wrong with broke people. The Bible says the poor will be with you always. But if you don't want to be poor, you better get around somebody who has been there and learn how to get out. You can't tell me how to get out of something you haven't been there. Yeah, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta walk around with some people. You wanna learn how to do ministry differently. You gotta be around somebody who does it differently. And here's the thing, it's not about imitation. It's about inspiration. Because when you see other people working what they have, working the gifts and working the assignment that they have, you begin to think to yourself, maybe God really can use me. Maybe he really does have a word in me. Maybe he really does have an assignment on my life. Maybe, just maybe, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise God. Yeah. We're different. I can't keep doing the same stuff, saying the same stuff. Stop praying the same prayers. The Bible says, let the Holy Spirit tell you what to pray. Stop praying the same prayers. God is great. God is good. And we thank him for his food. That's not going to stir heaven. That's not going to shake the foundations of heaven when you need healing in your body. Yeah. That's not going to cause the angels to get fired up and scramble to come to your rescue when you're under attack. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to cry out from your belly. Yeah. Do it differently. Do it deliberately. Don't just do things because other people are doing things. Right. Do things because you know God is directing you that's to do them. Right. And that's where you find yourself consistently Amen. prosperous. Amen. I have never in ministry tried to be, well, no, 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 not never, not never. When I first started preaching, I wanted to be Noel Jones. You know, you know, I thought he was, I'm going to be honest, I thought I wanted to be Noel Jones. And I realized I can't be Noel Jones because he's already Noel Jones. So I got to be Kelvin Brooks. And that has to be good enough. I got to be deliberate about being who God created me to be. Be deliberate. Do what other people are doing, say what other people are saying. God, what do you want from me? I know what they've got and what they're doing. I know what you called them to do. What do you want from me? Do it differently, do it deliberately, and do it divinely. To do it divinely means to do it under his instruction. It means to do it in the timing and in the way that is most fitting to him, in the way that would glorify him the most. Do it in his divine order. Yes, I cannot stress enough the importance to make sure that your motive is not about you being satisfied, but about God being pleased with what you have given him. Yes. With God being pleased with your obedience 
obedience to his word. Sometimes God calls us to stuff, not because he really needs us to do it, but because he wants to know who will be obedient. Yeah. Oh, I shared this testimony last Sunday. I was preaching in Philadelphia. The night before that Saturday, we were at an ordination service. And the Lord said, listen, now you know, you know how we are with money. You know, we tight with money because none of us really ever have as much as we want, right? Mm -hmm. But I learned a long time ago to be free with money because I learned that God gives seed to the sower. Yeah. So I learned that if I learn, if I know how to give, he'll always make sure I have something to give. Mm -hmm. And I'm in this service. This is a high, holy service. We're about to ordain these people. And God says, as people are coming around from the offering, God says, there's somebody in here. I want you to call them out and invite them to come up and to be honest about the fact that they have a need. He said, and if, they're, if they'll do that, he said, I want you to release money into them and open the doors for others to come and bless them. So I said, okay, God. I reach into my pocket. I get out a $100 bill. I grip it in my hand. I get up. I stand up. I start speaking. I start saying what the Lord wants me to say. All right, is there one? I know there's somebody in here. I don't know who it is, but God's calling you. And as I'm moving, I begin to hear the Holy Spirit say, stop right over there. And God's showing me this woman in the back. And, I, and in my flesh, I want to call her out. Because I want to bless her. Because why? Givers got to give. That's, that's, that's our nature. We got to give, right? But God said, no. God said, she's got to want it. she got to come and get it. You can't call her up for it. You can't call her to be blessed. She's got to want to come and get it. And I kept going as long as I could. And the Holy Spirit said, okay, that's enough. I said, all right, that's enough. I said, God bless you. And I went down and I sat down. And I said to myself, because, you know, we have these moments in our flesh and we want to make sure that we're still hearing God. I said, God, what was that? was that? Why would you have me do that? You know, why, why? God said, because she had to want it, and she didn't want it. Jesus said, will you be made whole? She, she wasn't ready to be blessed. T.D. Jakes wrote a book a long time ago, can you stand to be blessed? The truth is, some people are not ready to be blessed. And you're wondering why God has not opened up the windows of heaven and poured you out a blessing yet, because you're not ready for it. You can't handle it. So God said, you have to learn, if you want to strengthen what remains, to move divinely. Don't move because you think it's the right move. Don't move because you can see it working out right. Move because you know I said move. And be okay with whatever the outcome is. Because sometimes it's not what you think it is. It's something else. God says we prophesy what? In part. We don't know the fullness of what God's trying to do. I sat there and I'm working this out with God and the Spirit. He says, now the bishop sitting behind you, tap him and give it to him. I said, okay. I tapped him. He leaned forward, and I put it in his hand, didn't even look at him. A second went by, two seconds went by. He grabbed me, he fell down on his knees and grabbed me with tears in his eyes. He said, we needed this. He said, it's time. We got to take care of the church. And, and this, 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 this is a demand on us. He said, you don't know how much this blessed me. He said, I was, I was going back and forth with God. I didn't know if it was me or what I should do. I didn't say nothing. Because I knew it wasn't him. But here's the thing. If you don't want what God has for you, he's going to give it to somebody. He's going to give it to somebody. Uh, I want you to understand, people of God, now is not the time to shrink back. Now is not the time to accept failure or defeat. Now is the time to strengthen what remains. I understand. I get it. This is not how you thought it would go. I understand. This is not where you thought you would be. You want to be further along. You want to be in a different place, in a different position. We're going home. Trust me. I want you to understand, though, you must remember that if you're doing it God's way, he will be glorified and you will be edified. If you're doing it his way, he will keep you for such a time as this. If you're doing it his way, he will ensure that you will not be overcome. When you get up tomorrow morning, I want you to get up with a fresh spirit in your mind, saying to yourself, I know I don't have everything I should have, but what I do have, I'm going to take care of. Strengthen what God remains. The old church will say, a charge to keep my hand. A God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, and a fit for the sky to serve the present age. My calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do the Master's will. Charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a charge to keep I have, a God who must be glorified. I may not have everything, but what I do have, I'll strengthen. What I do have belongs to Him. God be glorified. Arm me with watchful care. As in thy sight to live, and now thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give.
Will he say, well done? Come on, stand to your feet. Let's go home with the Lord. Say, well done. Mm -hmm. Will he be pleased with what you've given him? God could have just said, you know what, sorry, I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to give you over to yourself. I'm going to just take you out. But he said, no, there's still something of value in you. You still have something to offer. The people still need you. The Bible says the whole earth waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And my question is, are you going to reveal yourself? Are you going to stay wrapped up in what was? What is right now? Or are you going to turn this thing around and say, you know what, God? I thank you that you've given me something. I have some resource to work with. I'll put it to good use. I'll turn it around for your glory. Souls seem to be saved, set free, and delivered. I want you to understand this is a life thing. It's not about profit or reward. It's about purpose. When you realize that you were born for something, something more than just showing up, Something more than just participating. Put your heart in this thing. Yes. That's why I love Pastor Brian. He knows right where I'm going. Yeah. You have to realize that God is expecting more from you. You got to realize that he's willing to help you get to where he wants you to be. Yes. And when you realize that, you can take what little bit you have and you can turn it into enough to bless everybody. everybody. Two fish, five loaves. to realize that what we have is enough because in the master's hand everything is multiplied yeah. everything is exponentially yeah. better which means even my little bit of faith maybe that's the prayer I need to pray you, you read the Bible it says God I believe but help my unbelief help me in the places where I haven't grown enough help me in the places where I'm still striving to become better help me to be exactly what you want me to be don't let me be satisfied with compromise. Yes, yes. Don't let me become complacent mm -hmm. with just showing up. Jesus. Push me. That's why I always say this prayer, God, challenge us. Yes. Challenge us. The moment you don't feel challenged in your life, the moment you don't feel challenged in the church, is the moment you become complacent. Oh. Jesus said, they thought they were alive, but they were dead. Thank you. Here we stand with a new opportunity today, a day we've never seen before. Amen. A day filled with possibilities and probabilities. It's a new chance for us to get it right. Yes, God, we've sinned. We've fallen short. We've missed you. We haven't heard you at times. But here in this moment, we commit ourselves to exactly what you want for us. Not what we want for ourselves, but what you want for us. Remember, winning is not when people tell you, oh, you sing real well. Oh, you preach real good. Oh, you led a great Bible study. says, well done. You have kept the faith. Yeah, you fought the good fight. You run the race.